Hello, welcome everybody. This is David Sprinkle, the Research Director for Package Packs. This is our second Culinary Trend Tracking Series webinar this year with the topic this time on natural and organic food trends. I want to give a special welcome to Package Facts Knowledge Center subscribers and our other PF clients and to our other guests through various partners and associates. I also want to give a special shout out to some of our pet food manufacturing clients who are joining us, which is a tribute to the wide-ranging implications of natural channel trends for the overall processed food market and for the role of the natural channel as an incubator for innovation in the, uh, within the overall industry. A few housekeeping notes before I turn things over to our speaker. The um, webinar deck and the audio file will be freely available after the session. Registrants and attendees will automatically get an email in a day or two afterward with links. Package Facts clients can also always get the deck through their account representative. The, in addition, there will be a question and answer session after the main presentation. So I encourage you to send in any questions along the way so we can get those organized for that final part of the webinar. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Karen Nielsen. Um, she, her credentials were noted in the invitation material, so I'll let those speak for themselves. But I've had the pleasure of working with Kara for many years, and her work is always very informed and insightful about food industry trends. She's also very good at reminding us that food should not only be nutritious or also or on trend, but also appetizing. And you'll find that over the course of the session. With that, let me turn it over to you, Kara. Thank you, David, and welcome, everyone. I'm Kara Nielsen, and I'm excited to be sharing this really interesting topic. Obviously, the natural channel and natural products have been growing uh, for many years, and uh, those in the food industry have been watching this. We're going to talk today about a handful of topics that we feel are really where a lot of the growth is in this natural and organic market. Uh, there are many, many topics. Uh, there is a new Package Facts report coming out that speaks to the broader topic and also has a lot of uh, facts and figures. Today we're going to look at five topics. I'm going to start with the most mainstream topics and move to the most emerging topics. And these are really where a lot of innovation and growth is coming from, and also where consumers continue to be excited and are really looking to for new answers for their diets. We'll be going over going clean, grass-fed protein, beverage benefits, new superfoods, plant-based growth. I'll wrap up with some strategic inspirations, and then we'll save some minutes at the end for your questions and answers. I think the biggest thing to remember is that the reason the natural channel and natural products are resonating is because they align with what consumers are looking for today. We've seen consumer demands around food really evolve in the last 10 years, uh, in part driven by the growth and the arrival of the millennial demographic into the market. But we've also just had a real change of mind as we move away from kind of what the food industry was decades ago into where food is going. So we see the natural market really delivering on these qualities that people are seeking today, first and foremost, freshness. But equally important are healthful ingredients and foods, and foods that fit our various niche diets. Uh, people are following all kinds of diets today, and the Natural Channel has been great at really responding to that. We're seeing clean labels as a matter of course. The transparency of ingredient sourcing, manufacturing, and label practices is also something that's been very much at the heart of natural products industry and organic products as well. And of course, the eco-consciousness that really comes from this whole group, uh, the sustainable practices that we're seeing, and these new models and real innovations that are leading the way. What's also really great about the Natural Grocery Channel is that it's an experience that's really different from what grocery stores used to be. And it has really expanded how we shop and offered new ways for 
uh, guests in grocery stores and the retail markets to have interactive experiences, to engage with the products. Obviously, all these great prepared food bars that we're seeing, uh, the grocery stores that almost feel like restaurants. Contemporary merchandising, really cool shelf sets that really tell a lot about what's going on with the product as well as really great on-trend global flavors and interesting food and beverages. These smaller footprint stores also allow for more frequent visits. Again, this goes back to freshness uh, and also easier in and out. Although these are also places people really love to hang out. And this is where the natural channel has really uh, answered consumer demands. Looking at an overview of the market, I think most of us know that the natural channel is growing faster than the conventional channel. And when I speak to the natural channel, this is both natural and organics grouped together into a very large market that includes um, a lot of, of the food items. Um, sometimes supplements are also included in these numbers. But we're looking at the food and beverages here, which Package Facts is uh, marking as growing 12% compared with a very flat conventional market. And that's a really big difference here. The market is also on track to read to record 69 billion at the end of 2016. Some of the categories that we're really seeing this growth, snack food, uh, tremendous movement in dairy, especially yogurt, and refrigerated non-dairy. Those would be the almond milks and other kinds of um, plant-based milks that are in the refrigerated case. Uh, lots of beverage action, and of course, some of the things you'd expect, the meat, fish, poultry, and eggs, that those fresh categories. Produce also is part of this. You'll see, though, right now, what's also very interesting is that the mass market and the natural channel are really divvying up all of this growth. So we have conventional grocery stores that are selling just as much natural and organic food as the natural channel. And this is very important and really a sign of the importance of these natural organic products for consumers shopping in everywhere. You'll also see that warehouses and clubs are really starting to also try to get their share of these sales with an 8% uh, portion of the total. We know that shopping for natural and organic brands has been an activity that larger food manufacturing companies have been participating in now for many years. Uh, there have been a big uptick in sales in the mergers and acquisitions department. And you can see here just some of the notable sales of these very interesting, compelling natural brands, many started by small entrepreneurs and then uh, cultivated and grown to a size where they have then become interesting uh, for the larger companies or private equity or capital growth firms to purchase or make a serious investment in. Uh, this continues every day. It, fe it seems like there are new acquisitions and uh, investments. Uh, I think one of the biggest this year, of course, was Danone buying Whiteway Foods. Um, so it's kind of like the big fish and the smaller fish, and it just, uh, it just keeps growing. So this is a very busy business channel. Uh, and we see some very beloved brands, uh, Annie's, Justin's. These are companies that have very loyal brand followers. So the companies, the smaller natural companies, are certainly hoping to extend their reach, get bigger distribution, greater support so they can grow and meet more consumer needs where the existing customers and brand loyalists are also hoping that these brands maintain um, the qualities and the benefits that they're offering and that they don't lose anything by getting bigger. What's also really exciting to note is that what's going on in the natural channel is something that's also going on in the food service channel. Uh, we have seen a great increase in really interesting food service concepts, mostly in the fast casual variety, but also some casual dining, that are really serving what people, and especially millennials, are looking for today. This is a really exciting space to look, looking at some of the new concepts like Jose Andres in Washington, D.C., opening up beef steak. Uh, this is a vegetable bowl concept. Um, also interesting to note, the protein bar, which started out as a quinoa-focused kind of bodybuilder healthful chain that then expanded into a lot of shakes and smoothies and quinoa bowls, has now um, spun off a second concept called Thrive 360 Eatery to expand its appeal beyond just a kind of hardcore protein quinoa approach into more natural eating. Seeing these move out, the first uh, units have opened up in Chicago. Uh, 
But we also have the salad chains, some of the vegan and veggie chains, and even the Life Kitchen and True Food Kitchen, more of a casual dining environment, are all really embracing these same qualities that we're finding in the natural and organic market. So let's dive into our first main trend here. And again, this is something that I know is no surprise to listeners. We really know that the food, our food supply is cleaning up. But what is interesting to note is it has taken a long time for some of the major food companies in uh, this country to respond to some of these product claims and clean labels that have been on the natural and organic products already for quite a while. Um, and so we recognize that it's challenging to make these changes. Um, it's challenging to play with some of these beloved brands. I'm looking at Heinz Ketchup here and thinking about what an iconic flavor that is for so many Americans and how do you clean up some of those labels. Uh, and yet these are things that our uh, largest companies are really uh, achieving now and making a lot of great strides and trying to do and really bring out some of these simple, pure, and good products. So we see Nabisco Good Thins coming out. We see new, um, very clean label coffee creamers, for example, coming out from International Delight. And this is very much in line with what consumers are looking for today. It's also in line with what we're seeing happening in food service, where Forward-leaning companies like Panera Bread um, have really led the way in showing that you really can clean up some of these labels, removing artificial ingredients, artificial flavorings, and uh, high fructose corn syrup, some of those things that we're really interested in not eating on a regular basis. And now we're seeing some of the larger companies like Subway and McDonald's following suit. Clean Colors is probably one of the biggest achievements in this effort to clean up some of our very traditional uh, food items. It's been interesting to note that this uh, cleaning up artificial, removing artificial colors is something that has been happening in the European Union for much longer. And it has taken uh, U.S. food companies quite a while to moving towards this direction. We do see on a global level that 60% of consumers say the absence of artificial colors is a major important element when they're making their food service decisions. So luckily we are now uh, seeing companies turn to more of these natural colors that are made from different kinds of vegetables uh, and are also often non-GMO. Some of the big uh, headlines this year have been removing the artificial colors from Trix cereal and you can see uh, that General Mills did a really good job of communicating what they were doing, getting consumers involved and educating on what these changes were, why they were doing them. And I think this ad is a really good example of that. Taking a different tack, Kraft Mac and Cheese very quietly to remove the artificial colorings in, the, in its iconic mac and cheese and didn't tell anyone until earlier this year, at which point they made the point of, hey, you didn't even notice that we took, uh, that we changed your favorite mac and cheese. Um, this was another uh, successful um, uh, angle. We also saw some new organic jelly bellies. And we see that some of the largest food companies are also pledging to remove some of these colors uh, in years to come, like Mars and Mondelez. Looking over here on the right of the Love Grown Food, it is interesting to note that especially in the cereal space, some of our natural and organic brands have been doing this all along. And they may end up being more authentic, uh, more believable to consumers, especially a hardcore natural organic shopper who are looking for a product that starts clean and stays clean. And you'll see some of the ways that these smaller companies are really trying to address that need from the get-go. Also looking at uh, clean meals, uh, this is something we know as consumers continue to look for convenience meals uh, that they want to be healthful, to be appetizing, to also be on trend. So we continue to see competition coming from the meal delivery space where any number of smaller scale uh, chef kits are offering some of these clean meals. Here's green chef meal kits uh, coming out of Boulder, which makes a lot of sense, offering natural organic ingredients along with alternative diet meals with a lot of recyclable packaging. 
We also see natural leader Evol with these very attractive, well-priced fajita cups. They're coming out of the freezer space. Really quick and easy way uh, to have a quick meal that also offers organic brown rice and black beans. And then we see the larger companies like ConAgra's Healthy Choice coming up with these cafe steamers. This simply line, nothing artificial, offering some of these similar types of meals that are also healthful, you know, not just clean, but also healthful as well as kind of appealing in a comfort food space. So this is some real progress that we're seeing this year. Another trend that has really burst out in the last year is what I've been calling is the better baking trend. And this makes a ton of sense when you think about a lot of the baking that comes from baking mixes, jarred frostings, uh, some of these items in that baking aisle, these are very family-centric products. Kids are the main consumer in many cases of these. So it totally makes sense that not only do we have a surge in natural and organic products, offering alternatives, but we also see the conventional companies stepping up and removing a lot of these artificial flavors and ingredients, the preservatives, out of some of these lines. So we see Pillsbury's Purely Simple offering this, but what may be more appealing to millennials is Miss Jones Baking Company. This is a San Francisco startup offering an organic lineup from the get-go. You can see the USD Organic is a very compelling offering. We're also seeing some of these natural colors coming from uh, smaller entrepreneurs that are really making an effort to, again, get rid of some of these artificial colors in food coloring that really uh, have a, can have a very negative effect on children. And we know children are one of the main consumers of brightly colored icings and uh, cookies that um, are really attractive. So this is, really makes sense. Our next trend is also one that we feel is really very compelling, getting a lot of attention and continuing to grow. And it's not without its challenges, but this is the trend of grass-fed protein. We see that they are continuing to grow at a rate of close to 30% a year over the last decade. Again, this is pretty big growth. The other side of that is it's still probably less than a 6% share of all the meat that's being purchased. Um, the meat and dairy, I would say. However, it is important to really think like this is where the growth is coming from, and so this is where we see consumers headed. Right now, these grass-fed uh, meat products are coming, some from the United States, but also some from overseas in South America and also New Zealand and Australia, um, covering all kinds of meat, of course. Certain meats like buffalo are always grass-fed, and, and that's one of the things that's interesting about bison or buffalo meat. Um, but more and more of this grass-fed beef um, is really kind of coming to market. I feel like every time I look, there's a new brand that's coming out, which is really exciting. What's the consumer appeal here? Obviously, there are more nutrients in grass-fed beef over conventional beef. We know that there's also no hormones or antibiotics, and they're GMO-free. This is also much better for the food system, uh, for the animals and the planet. And we also uh, know that people are really interested in this traditional element, the fact that this is how animals were raised traditionally for eons, and that it's only um, a very uh, recent phenomenon that we've actually turned into this, the more recent ways of, of raising cattle in a huge number. And it's really leaning on the planet. One of the challenges here is that there's not necessarily a standard definition for grass-fed at the moment. And this is the same with the natural products. We know that natural doesn't have a set definition. Organic does, but it continues to be tweaked, um, much to the dismay of very long-time organic promoters. So we'll have to watch and see what happens with some of these definitions, but do recognize that this is a topic that continues to be sort of tied up in government bureaucracy. Some of the brands that are really stepping up in the grass-fed beef department are uh, smaller brands at the local level, things like Belcampo Meat, which is an integrated meat company. Uh, Belcampo is based in California where they are raising beef, they are uh, processing it themselves, and they also have butcher shops and restaurants where they are serving uh, this meat and in, in a very sort of premium upscale way, but in a way that also um, is very transparent. There are other brands as well that are um, coming up from around the country. We see Texas and even Wisconsin involved with raising 
uh, grass-fed and in many cases organic beef. Uh, this pre-brand coming out of Chicago, although the beef is from New Zealand, showing how innovative this can be and how very contemporary. Just look at that packaging. And I really love that 100% grass-fed message at the top with the grass. Um, makes it very clear for consumers who are trying to understand this new offering. And then there are more long-standing companies like Panorama that are also um, have been selling to Whole Foods for quite some time. So there's a nice uh, set of offerings here. We also see food service really responding to this grass-fed uh, opportunity. And this is in part driven by consumer demands. And so some of these small restaurant chains, certainly these better, part of this larger, better burger chain. So as we see Shake Shack, Shake Shack grow, we're also seeing some of these other concepts that are developed really based on a foundation of offering an alternative meat product. Um, things like Farm Burger out of Georgia, Elevation Burger out of Virginia, and even Burger Lounge in Southern California, which now is also promoting its bison offering. You have uh, Shiregate All Beef Hot Dogs. This is from a grass-fed beef that's grown in Missouri, and that's owned by a former NFL linebacker. Uh, making sense here is also selling some of these hot dogs at the St. Louis football stadium. But I think the biggest testament to this being a big trend to pay attention to is the fact that Carl's Jr. and Hardee's has invested in an all-natural burger made with grass-fed meat. This is a, this is a really big deal. Um, obviously, sourcing this much meat always will remain a challenge, and as we have to wait for supplies again to grow, but the fact that a major company is really invested in this is a sign of growth. Here's an example of the advertising from Elevation Burger here. You can really see a lot of consumer education, a lot of pride, uh, definitely putting out both a healthy message here as well as you know, for the planet and uh, for consumers' diets. I think what's also been so fascinating is part of what is helping grow the grass-fed uh, as well as some of the natural poultry as well, are the rise of the paleo eaters. So this paleo connection to any kind of pastured product has been a big force in the natural and organic channel. These are people who are turning to the paleo diet for a variety of reasons. They may only be doing it 50% of the time or 80% of the time, but the fact that a group of consumers is thinking about where their meat comes from and are making very concerted choices to have grass-fed meat to bypass the, the large-scale meat production is a sign that this education is getting out there and that's trickling through these various uh, consumer diet tribes uh, and alternative diet tribes. We also recognize that they really feel that there's a big health connection here. This is part of the CrossFit connection as well as clean protein lovers, and then real food adherents. So you see it's not just paleo people, but quite a few different types of consumers are really looking for this grass-fed protein. We're seeing the market respond by introducing a great variety of meat snacks that are made with grass-fed meat, especially in this very busy jerky section and this sort of, now we can't even say jerky, it's much beyond that, much more in the meat snack area of looking at Epic, which is a real pioneer in this area, which again, and testament to that, was its recent purchase by General Mills. But it has introduced meat bars, trail mix, little bacon bites, and now it's also selling jarred animal fats and bone broth. We also saw the new Primal. I thought this was very interesting. They came out this year with snack meats for kids. And these are like a beef or a turkey uh, sausage stick for kids, which really makes sense. Obviously, kids don't have to be paleo. Uh, and a parent doesn't have to be paleo to care about a clean meat snack for their child. We'll also continue to see this bone broth. Again, this is very small, but uh, we're still seeing new products come to market, which really offering a lot of these great nutrients from uh, grass-fed cattle. And then meal delivery companies is sort of another area that's a little outside of the market where we're also seeing a lot of grass-fed meats uh, moving towards. One of the most interesting uh, new products here, the Primal Kitchen Dark Chocolate Almond Bar with grass-fed collagen. Collagen is something we've been seeing coming out of Asia uh, in the sense of it's like improves your skin. Whether that's true or not, it is interesting to see this call out on a very appealing and 
an indulgent snack bar. I think even bigger than the grass-fed meat side, are we seeing more and more consumers embrace grass-fed dairy. And the dairy, these companies are also taking it very seriously about it, educating consumers about what the benefits are in these uh, products. So we can see all kinds of dairy products here. Um, certainly grass-fed milk, I think Organic Valley coming out several years ago with the grass milk was a real sign of where this um, trend was going. Uh, and they were an early innovator that branded its milk as coming from grass. We also see some of the smaller uh, batch dairy producers also doing grass-fed. In this case, 1871 is an example of a company in Chicago selling to restaurants. Jenny Splendid Ice Cream has always been using grass-fed milk with a really nice sticker there. And I think we're going to continue to see more brands uh, move into this direction. Right now, butter has been a big topic, in part because of uh, the notion of good fats that have been embraced again. And so we're seeing a lot of love for companies like Kerrygold Butter, which has always used uh, Irish grass-fed cows as its source. It also continues to rate very highly on taste tests. And it now has found new life as an ingredient in bulletproof coffee which the idea being that it's probably like putting half and half in your coffee. You get some really good fats that also help sustain you as you're having your delicious cup of coffee. We're starting to see other products coming online, whether it's ghee or brown butter or even candy bars that have grass-fed butter as part of the mix. Yogurt, of course, is another very, very big category in the natural and organic space. It continues to see some very innovative growth. And here you see two brands, Stonyfield and Maple Hill, that have recently rebranded uh, and redesigned their packaging to really get this message out about what is in this uh, cup of yogurt. This is the same thing that some of the Skier brands have been doing. Uh, Skier is an Icelandic or Norwegian style yogurt that's made with grass-fed milk. Iggy's was an early brand. Uh, we've seen uh, several new brands come to the dairy case offering these same types of claims and using these same ingredients. And it's uh, similar over in the cultured dairy space with some of the new brands offering different types of Indian style uh, lassies or even some of the kefirs and different dairy snacks. So continue to expect to see this really grow. And I think this is much easier for consumers to get to. Grass-fed meat can still not taste what we're used to. I mean, we're not. it doesn't taste exactly like the grain-fed beef that many of us were raised on, but the dairy uh, really just tastes very delicious in part due to the extra fat and nutrients. Looking at beverages, we know this is a very, very big uh, category in the natural and organic space. And again, there you go into any kind of natural market and you'll see beverage cases all around the perimeter as well as in the back of the store. There are all kinds of beverages here. And this is in part because there are so many wonderful benefits now that these beverages are offering to consumers. For example, we see more nutrients and fortification in this space, a lot of protein fiber, probiotics and prebiotics, antioxidants and omegas. We also see a lot of natural energy boosts, and this is as consumers move away from some of the classic sodas, some of the uh, sort of large kind of Red Bull type energy beverages, and are looking for more natural types of boosts, whether it's from caffeine or different kinds of plant energy, like from yerba mate or different types of tea. We also know that electrolytes for replenishment are very important for performance-seeking uh, consumers. So all in all, this is definitely something we're seeing being delivered from the natural space. Sensory thrills is another thing that's really coming out. And this is to remember that not everything about the natural and organic channel is just about some kind of nutrient boost. And this is what David was mentioning earlier, that um, I really get excited about what the appetizing element is, what's delicious, what's fun to consume. And we're seeing more beverages with a sparkling body or even some of these nitro coffees. So this is really changing the drinking experience. We also see layers and depth of flavor, different types of textures, whether it's thick and creamy or something light and smooth. 
and then plenty of variety. This is also what's really driving a lot of growth here. Different sizes of these different beverages, whether it's shots to individual serve to multi-serve. We're seeing a variety of different containers that are really interesting. And then also different kinds of sweeteners. These all make up uh, the variety options that are being delivered in this space. One of the big areas where we're really seeing a ton of energy is coffee and tea. Um, and certainly looking at all the many ways that coffee is now coming to us. We see these caffeine boosts in um, a host of different types of drinks. And what's interesting to note is these, a lot of these same things are found in the new coffee shops that have been rippling out, different kinds of tea salons and juice bars. So these trends are really um, on both sides, both food service and in the retail market. Uh, we're starting to see some of these bottled butter coffees going along the Bulletproof coffee trend here where there's a little bit of, uh, whether it's the MCT, which are the uh, mid-chain fatty acids from coconut oil or butter uh, that really uh, offer a lot of sustainability and sustenance here, or sus sustenance really, and help you sustain your day. So these are starting to appear in bottles. We're also seeing more resourceful coffee drinks. This is looking at different ways we can use the coffee plant and get a new kind of beverage and a new beverage experience. And several of these have been coming out, one made with a coffee leaf, the Kona coffee leaf tea, and then also the cascaras, which are made from the coffee cherry or the dried husk of the coffee bean that is basically um, a byproduct of the coffee industry and that had traditionally been used uh, by coffee growing farmers as an extra ingredient and then they would infuse it like a tea and it has a real fruity flavor. It doesn't really taste like coffee but there are residual antioxidants and caffeine that are available here. So we're definitely seeing this cascara coming out of the coffee industry but again it's a bigger notion of how we can be more resourceful with our food supply. And then the biggest news in coffee, of course, is the cold brew explosion. Years ago, cold brew used to be pretty much something you would just see in a small local area. It would be a coffee shop was maybe doing a cold brew and selling it bottled in a local independent grocery store. But now we're seeing that these smaller brands have gotten big. They are now distributed more widely across the United States. And we're also seeing the very large players step in a little after the fact into this cold brew space. So now the likes of Starbucks and Pete's have joined uh, some of the leaders like Blue Bottle, uh, Stemtown Coffee, of course, which really is the big leader in this space. Uh, and then we're also seeing brands like Califia really um, making great strides. So there's tons of energy here. Some of the news is coming from cold brews that are made with different kinds of bases, like the Happy Tree, which is made with um, maple water. We're also seeing some of these cold brews with coconut water. Um, you can see here the Califia came out with a nitro cold brew uh, recently and La Colum, which is a coffee maker out of um, Pennsylvania, they have a draft latte. So there's a lot of innovation here on packaging and delivering a really interesting experience. And this is some of the texture part that I was talking about earlier. Um, what's so new here? I think also this chameleon cold brew with the Texas pecan coffee. Chameleon is from Austin, Texas and really sort of shining its regional pride here by putting a little Texas pecan flavor in that coffee. Tea has also been and a big source of innovation here. We're seeing bottled tea continue to explode um, and it's really gone way beyond, way, way beyond what we've seen in only a few years here. Now some of the biggest trends are looking at changing the body of tea in a bottled form. So we're starting to see sparkling teas, uh, some very nice effervescence. This of course is competing directly with different kinds of sodas and carbonated beverages. We're also seeing more unsweetened bottled varieties and it used to be very difficult to find an unsweetened tea in a bottle and now we continue to see brands either be founded on this principle or offer uh, varieties and alternatives without extra sweetener and with no artificial, sweet, artificial sweetener as well. So these are very clean, really delicious um, tea focused refreshments. And then, of course, tea has always been considered a tonic and a wellness ingredient. 
And we're seeing sort of on the fringe side here some really interesting tea tonics, uh, tea with adaptogenic herbs, which are the herbs that help support a body's stress, or even bottled tea made with different kinds of leaves that are similar to tea, like the asi, which is made with a U.S. grown uh, yapon tea leaf. And um, the artisan, again, also is a great example of how beautiful these products are, very lovely packaging, very clear messaging. So it's a really exciting time for tea. Another very big topic in the beverage space in the natural and organic channel are all of the digestive offerings. And of course, probiotics, uh, a huge topic, a very mainstream benefit. Uh, but we're seeing in the natural organic space some really new ways of offering that benefit, whether they are different kinds of smoothies that have been fortified with probiotics, or even some of these newer kind of gut shots that are coming from the brands that are typically making fermented foods like sauerkraut or kimchi. And so these are coming from a more natural space of a lacto-fermented product where we have these extra probiotics. And these are very small little bottles. They're just like a little shot. Obviously, they're pretty tart, uh, you can imagine, but it's uh, a neat way of thinking about getting your little dose of probiotics. Meanwhile, in a more palatable and a little more mainstream ways are companies like Uncle Matt's with an organic cold-pressed probiotic water. Uh, again, offering refreshment, offering that cold-pressed, really great flavor benefit there, as well as the probiotics here. Now, whether we're going to start seeing more fiber uh, is hard to say. It's, it's interesting to think about how we drink our fiber, but companies like Harvest Soul are putting out probiotic and high fiber juices, uh, which are really interesting because I know a lot of the pressed juices are getting some flack because we're really losing all of that great fiber that's in the vegetables that are juiced and put into some of those juices. So is this a way of putting some of this back? I've also been excited to see drinking vinegars start coming up in this space. Uh, drinking vinegars have been around for a number of years, kind of coming out of Asia, or coming from the shrub space, which is more of a cocktail space of these shrubs that are made with um, vinegar and fruit that is cooked down and preserved and then used as an ingredient in cocktail making. But now we're seeing some of the uh, well-known beverage makers like Suja and Live Kombucha really embracing this probiotic benefit and bringing it to consumers using apple cider or other kinds of vinegars in these sort of tart yet still very approachable um, beverages that are just coming out this year. We also know that there are a huge number of plants that are being used for all kinds of functional boosts in a lot of different beverages here in this space. So turmeric has definitely been something that has been growing year on year. As we see more people recognize that this inflammation claim is for real, there was a study that came out just uh, this past month really showing that the turmeric really does make a difference and these beverages are a way of having enough turmeric to really make a difference difference on someone's immunity here. And we're seeing some big brands like uh, Blueprint coming into here and again Califia Farms with a new ginger almond milk with turmeric. The adaptogenic plants again, this is something I'm very much watching coming up from the fringe, but they're doing really well. These again are uh, ingredients like ginseng, maca root, reishi mushroom, uh, manuka honey that are common in Chinese and Indian medicinal practices but are now being tapped to help us with our stressful lives. And these ingredients support us where we need them. Uh, what's great is that these beverages are very on uh, trend. They look great and they taste really good, especially I know the Rebel has been complimented for how appetizing it is. And then matcha tea has been a real success story over the last number of years. And now we're seeing it move out from just being kind of pure matcha tea into flavored matcha and different kinds of matcha brands really getting into this and offering options. This matcha bar, iced matcha tea coming from, a, this is a tea shop in Brooklyn. And then we also really love seeing this watermelon flavor. Watermelon's a hot flavor trend in and of itself this year in the beverage space in the National Organic Channel. 
Moving on to new superfoods, and we know that consumers continue to love and gravitate to superfoods. We really recognize that these benefits are coming from real food ingredients, and now we're seeing more ingredients that are a little closer to home than the Amazonian ones that we've been uh, exploring for the last number of years. For example, some of the new superfoods on the market are things that may not feel very new, but they're being put into new practice. And these are things like algae, seaweed, and spirulina, uh, offering all sorts of great benefits to the body, including uh, good B vitamins, iron, and different uh, other minerals that really support us, whether it's in a green superfood bar. This is sort of one of the easiest way to imagine where these green foods are coming. And here we have re wheatgrass and barley grass, along with spinach and alfalfa in these organic bars. Uh, one of the big benefits here is this alkalizing uh, benefit that a lot of folks are looking for to balance all the acidity uh, that's in our main diet. We're also seeing seaweed being used. The nori success of nori as a snack, especially for kids, has been huge. And now we're seeing seaweed move into some more snack crackers like these Mary's Gone Crackers. We're also seeing, and this is a little more invisible, but the algal oil that is being used mostly on an ingredient level for large manufacturers, offering an allergy-free sort of product that it gives sort of some of these mouthfeels, some of the, the fat and some of the good nutrition like omega fatty acids into these products where more traditional oils have been taken out and Enjoy Life Foods is a real leader in this in using these oils. But we're going to start seeing algal oil available for cooking and we certainly see it in more foods. So watch out for these as they start growing. Something that is hugely popular, of course, is the avocado. And uh, mostly this is that people buy avocados and they eat them at home. You can look at Pinterest and you'll see all the avocado roses or avocado toasts that consumers are making and taking pictures of. But what we see the industry doing is packaging avocados in ways that make them more convenient and let, allow us to have this delicious and healthful oil in our diet in a more frequent way or when you can't get your hands on a natural avocado. So things like this uh, avocado oil vinaigrette from Primal Kitchen is one example. We also see more snacks, uh, potato chips, for example, that are being cooked in avocado oil for that good fat benefit. And then also portable snacks like this Hope Foods spicy avocado Avocado hummus. This is a, a small little kind of 100 calorie pack that you can bring and kind of a grab and go type item. Uh, also, this Evoke, this is a really cool avocado smoothie in a bowl and it comes with quinoa puffs that you would then uh, stir into it to make a spoonable portable snack. Another huge ingredient that, uh, of our superfoods today. We're seeing the chickpea just really just everywhere. Think about hummus, totally mainstream food. It also offers a lot of terrific plant-based protein. Uh, we've been seeing uh, chickpea snacks for quite a few years now. Some of the new things we're starting to see, things like the Vanna Life Foods, these green chickpeas in an Indian-based pouch meal. I'm also really excited about the Tada falafel poppers. These are little falafel poppers that have the sauce inside the ball. Uh, these are sold in the frozen section and have some very forward-leaning, trendy flavors uh, for the little like kind of hummus on the inside. We're also seeing chickpeas do things like be crumbs. Uh, this would be like a gluten-free breadcrumb option. And the, uh, the bonza is a uh, penne made from chickpeas. Again, we've seen a lot of uh, legumes now being used in gluten-free pastas, and bonza is doing um, a really good job of a very contemporary look. And look at all of the protein and fiber. So these are some real benefits here. Some of the biggest news right now in the chickpea world is this notion of aquafaba, or this is using the chickpea cooking water that has a lot of this protein and benefits still in it and using that water to make vegan mayonnaises, vegan confections, uh, different kinds of meringues. So this is something that we're seeing in vegan bakeries. A lot of vegans at home are doing this and Sir Kensington went forward with this vegan mayo. Our last trend, and this is the most emerging but probably one of the most important, is looking at the plant-based protein. And we know 
uh, that it continues to grow, but what's exciting is that they become more affordable, more interesting, tastier. This is really responding to a call to arms for people to really recognize that we need to move in a plant-based direction. We need to look at the health of our planet and recognize as the population grows on a global scale that we need to turn to more plant-based foods for the protein as we go forward. So we're starting to see again more and more people doing this. 26% of survey consumers ate less meat from 12 months prior. So again, this is already something that's happening. 26% uh, is, that's a good amount. We're also seeing natural channels. So this is in the natural channel itself, the plant-based food sales have grown close to 11% in a year. Uh, again, that's three times the rate of growth in uh, the more conventional channel. So this is definitely something that's happening in a big way and that the consumers that are shopping natural are really looking for. So if you're trying to attract them, this is one way to go. We see also that plant-based food sales are almost up to five billion here, and this is a really big uptick. Some of the growth areas here are the non-dairy milks, the ones in the refrigerated case, as well as the meat and cheese alternatives. Another sign of the growth here, we now have a plant-based food association. This is an education and lobbying voice to try to really get the word out and the message to present the interests of the plant-based companies uh, and help them compete with some of the non-plant-based proteins that have very strong lobbying organizations. But this is also a great way to educate consumers about some of these benefits and options. What we're seeing here, where's the growth? We continue to see interest in non-soy protein in the plant-based space, also looking at non-GMO opportunities, gluten-free and allergy-free, and sustainable options. So when we look at these plant-based proteins, these are the benefits that consumers are looking for and not every plant-based protein um, meets these. So it is definitely something to keep in mind. Some of the meat analogs here that we're getting, again, this is a very exciting space. There seem to be new things every six months or so that are really kind of changing the story here. A lot of this innovation is coming from partnerships between science and research. Uh, the tech industry and the investment community that are uh, helping create these brands that are really going out there and trying to see what they can do to create some of these products in more of a science-based way. But we also are looking towards traditional plant-based societies for some hints, and that's where the jackfruit is coming from. This is kind of an, I don't mean old world in the sense of Europe, but old world in the sense of Asia, where jackfruit uh, where jackfruit is grown and it has been used as a meat-like substance uh, for quite a while. Now what's interesting here is there isn't a lot of protein in jackfruit, but jackfruit when it's cooked, and this is younger jackfruit plants before they get too sweet, are being cooked and shredded and then flavored like uh, different kinds of barbecue meat or um, different flavors that you would find in a taco or a wrap or a sandwich. And so we have several companies now that are offering this flavored meaty texture alternative to be used in a protein-centric center of the plate way. We also see some of these newer things like meat. Uh, this is a really great tasting product that's made from pecans and garbanzo beans as well as some whole grain oats, uh, kind of turning to both um, the nuts, seeds, and grain space to create a very tasty meat replacement. And then some of the out-of-this-world plant meat here coming from companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Food. These are companies that are getting a lot of press. They are really uh, very innovative. The latest one to really look at is the Impossible Meat Burger that is now even being served at one of the Momofuka restaurants in New York that has a meat-like flavor thanks to heme, which is an iron-containing molecule that the company is growing on yeast and blending into the patty. And we've already talked several times, we've mentioned the non-dairy magic. And this also continues to be a very impressive space where when we think about non-dairy, plant-based non-dairy years ago, it has changed so much. And we continue to see a lot of energy, a lot of investment, um, and a lot of innovation here. Pea protein, almonds, cashews, even macadamia nuts, coconuts, of course, even bananas, there's a new banana milk out right now, are being uh, put into use and harnessed for their various nutritional and structural elements to create a variety of beverages, cheese, butter, 
and desserts. And so we have here, for example, Ripple has been getting a lot of attention this year, uh, trying to offer an alternative to almond milk um, because it is using, using pea protein, which can be grown in a more sustainable way, according to the company. Also, a very flavorful kind of milk-like flavor is coming from this milkadamia product uh, with Australian macadamia nuts. On the cheese and butter space, this vegan cheese, we've had uh, kind of everyday cheese to be used on pizza or to be put on a sandwich for many years from companies like Dea, but now we're seeing these more innovative companies um, using almonds, using cashews, uh, using miso to create sort of new, more gourmet products. And so we've seen over the last couple of years these kind of fancy French-style cheeses or fresh-style cheeses coming out of the space. Uh, some of the things we're seeing now are these companies expanding and putting those cheeses into uh, value-added products. So you see here the Kite Hill Ricotta, which at the uh, Natural Expo East just won a Nexty Award, now is also available in a uh, ravioli that the company is putting out with its product, sort of helping you get there if that's what you're looking for. We also are really excited about Miyoko's Cultured Vegan Butter. Uh, that's made with coconut oil and cashews. Uh, it has a real authentic kind of tang, a very creative, really interesting product. And then we continue to see a lot of frozen desserts. Um, there's a lot of energy here in this frozen space using cashew nuts now, so Delicious is doing a really great job of some very flavorful, very satisfying cashew milk frozen desserts. And then like Natamu, which continues to win a lot of recognition for its great flavor. And finally, uh, looking back at this food service space, again, as another sign of the times, uh, we're seeing a lot of new types of food shops, of fast food options that are really representing this natural and organic space outside of the retail. I think what's really cool are young entrepreneurs that are opening up vegan butcher shops or vegan delis, and they are offering all of the sort of favorite kind of sandwich meats and some of these creamy salads and vegan desserts in a little shop and they're getting a ton of attention. I just think these two, this is a brother-sister group here that have this wonderful um, herbivorous butcher in Minneapolis. Uh, I live very close to Berkeley in Oakland and the Butcher's Son is a very popular new vegan deli that's uh, close to the UC Berkeley campus and really caters to a lot of students looking for these opportunities. In New York, by Chloe, uh, which is a very popular vegan kind of fast food offering, is expanding and has opened a new outlet in Boston, is also, also partnering with Whole Foods. And then we even see organic fast food coming um, from the stalwart brand of Amy's, uh, beloved uh, vegetarian brand. We also see a new drive through restaurant in Santa Rosa, California. And then some Costco executives have recently opened up an organic chicken Rest, fast casual restaurant in San Francisco. So in conclusion here, hopefully you have gleaned some interesting uh, tidbits about where this is going, but to give you some more inspiration here, when you're thinking about clean labels and clean colors, this is really considered a mandatory for a lot of national organic consumers, but it's not just about making a a simple analog, but it's also having contemporary flavors and innovative formats. So it's not enough to just sort of clean this up to compete. We really need to add something also extra. We're seeing grass-fed meat continue to have a small share, but we really think that consumers are understanding the issues around conventional meat production, and so this will continue to be something that they're going to be looking for uh, in both the meat and the dairy side. So we feel this is a very safe space to continue to innovate or to find ways to bring into what you're doing. On the grass-fed dairy side, this is very appealing. It has a very wholesome connection, connected to the land. Um, it feels very real for consumers. So let's start seeing more grass-fed dairy as an ingredient in desserts, beverages, and baked goods. The cold brew coffee, right now, huge in the refrigerated space, but it also is a wonderful flavoring. Uh, thinking about that kind of cold brew, which is very smooth, not acidic, that's one of the big appealing things. That smoothness in its artisan feel can be applied to things like caramel sauce or a barbecue sauce even, or different kinds of desserts. So how can you take this RTD drink, but find a way of leveraging it as a flavor or an ingredient? 
we also know that tea is very hot right now, especially with its wellness stature. So continue to find more places, whether it's in baked goods or different kinds of desserts that have a, a tea ingredient in it. This would be a great moment to try to leverage its on-trend status and its health halo. We also know that more minimally, our unsweetened beverages are really um, in demand from some consumers. So think about that if it's something that you're selling, how you can offer an alternative uh, that is either lower in sugar or completely unsweetened. Probiotics, they continue to be something that consumers really love and um, you know, are in more things than just fermented items. So this is definitely something to look at, at whether it makes sense in future products. And then again, keep looking at all these great plants uh, that uh, are telling a wonderful story. And it's beyond just the vegetables on the plate, but using more green vegetables and different items, whether it's cereal bars or different kinds of crackers, uh, that's a great space for this. Um, also looking at uh, more avocado for good fats or any kind of good fat ingredient. And then of course pulses, um, these are only gonna grow. We know that veggie burgers of all kind have really become very sexy these days. And uh, keep in mind though that different veggie burgers, you know, they, there's not a one size fits all, that allergens might be an issue, different kinds of intolerance like gluten. Uh, keep this in mind if this is something you're developing or putting on a menu. And we also know that pea protein continues to be sort of the star uh, plant protein. We also see brown rice protein coming up here. Look for ways that you may be able to add these into your portfolio. And this coming to the end of this presentation, thank you very much for joining us here. And I'm going to turn it over to David Sprinkle to share any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you, Carrie. You covered a terrific amount of ground there. Um, we will have time for just a few questions. Before that, though, just let me um, let me say again that you will be getting automatically an email where, where you can download the webinar deck or the audio file. We've had some questions about getting that. But you will get that automatically, or you can get it through your package fax or marketresearch.com account representative. Um, just, to, just time for maybe a couple of questions. The um, a lot several come in about sort of plant-based versus meat, and one basic question: both meat-based products like meat bars and plant-based alternatives are going full steam ahead. How do you see that playing out or adding up in the future? I see. It is interesting to see that as we're talking about plant-based, we're also talking about grass-fed meat. And I think that's to recognize, again, that there are a lot of different consumers that are looking for clean ingredients on both sides. So what I think is compelling about the meat snack area and the growth of the meat is there are now clean, clean offerings and more grass-fed offerings for maybe even people like vegetarians who now are coming back into the fold. People who may have been skipping meat for a while are now finding some very clean options there. Um, also, if people are going to eat meat, they want it to be uh, a grass-fed or a clean product that they can really get behind. And I think we're going to see as we continue to reduce the amount of animal protein in our diet, what we do eat is going to be as clean as possible. And that's where some of this growth is coming here. I do think plant-based, though, is going to continue to grow. And what's uh, great to remember is there are just so many different ways of doing it. I also think that the protein trend will also start segueing into more of a fiber trend. And we will recognize that we don't maybe need as much protein as we think. And so we will get by um, quite well in looking at some of these proteins that we are getting from uh, plant-based sources, and we can easily reduce the meat without really losing any core nutrition in our diet. Okay, another question came in about um, bone broth, which you mentioned. Any further assessment of this category and its potential, both as a nutrient-dense product, but also as a culinary solution and culinary base? Well, we know from a culinary solution that We've always had box stock uh, or canned stock, whether it's chicken stock for making soup at home or, or cooking. What we see with the broth is a richer flavor, more fats, um, less sodium. So it is kind of a higher level stock here. We're also starting to see some of these bras 
being packaged as, as beverages or concentrate to be used as beverages. I do think this is still a pretty, this is a very tiny category at the moment. It may grow. Um, it's also quite pricey. Um, so I, I do feel this is more of a niche thing that may not have mainstream appeal, but it may be fine to try to leverage for the time being whether our consumers interested in that, and then maybe look for applications in how can you move away from the broth space and turn it into more of a, um, basically improve our soups that we're making at home, kind of take it from being a niche health ingredient to how can we improve some of these broths that we, and stock that we're buying um, and have a little more nutrition in those, because those we know are long-standing products. Another question about um, uh, sort of alternative products. Do you have a sense whether for um, for non-dairy cheese, whether that whether non-vegan or non-dairy avoiding consumers are likely to turn to those? I think yeah. What I think is interesting about uh, the evolution of the non-dairy cheese market is it has gone from sort of the everyday cheeses that people who have a dairy allergy. Uh, perhaps have been forced to eat. And now it's turning into more of a pleasure proposition. So instead of being a sad substitute, we're now seeing these companies really offer a tasty, interesting uh, product that's based on traditional cheese styles. Um, and I think what it will do is, bit by bit, while these do have a price premium, and right now they're catering to a sort of premium-seeking vegan consumer, um, as this grows and the prices come down and people are looking for plant-based alternatives, they will find that these are enjoyable options. Um, if you're entertaining or if you have a family member who eats in this way, then it may be the, the better tasting they are, the more people they will appeal to, even the non-vegans. So I think there is potential for families, um, for couples that are trying to make sure that all the products they have in the refrigerator are um, all right for everyone instead of having two options. I think it's also really great for people who are entertaining to have an option for vegans who may be part of a, a gathering to have uh, something that is there. So the fact that they are nice tasting and they have the similar textures I think is a sign that they are trying to get beyond just a core a kind of hardcore, whether it's a dairy allergy or um, a vegan diet, to really have broader appeal. So again, I think that it's it's if you're a cheese lover, it's hard to let go of real cheese, but it's nice to have some really great tasting alternatives that can be uh, shared and, and used when you have a mixed group. Okay, one last question, although it's kind of a, a, a broad one. Um, do you see the paleo trend as being here to stay? Uh, I think what's interesting about the paleo trend, which to technically I've been calling a fad for some time, um, it feels like a fad, which is that it gets it appeals to a smaller segment, it moves very quickly, it gets a lot of attention, but then it tends to burn. Um, I feel we're already seeing, and I haven't seen statistics on this, and I would love to. Um, we're already hearing about the next diet, which is the ketogenic diet, which is basically another form of Atkins diet. Um, this appeals to people who are trying to lose weight really quickly, but again, these are very difficult diets to maintain long term. So I, I suspect people will cycle through, they will try paleo for a while, um, perhaps they will achieve some of the health benefits and dietary benefits they're looking for, whether they will sustain it. Um, Long, long term, I think it's going to remain small, but if it's for entrepreneurs who are really tapping into this, there are maybe some great opportunities for years to come. And I think that as we think about some of these bigger order benefits like the grass-fed, uh, grass-fed meat is going to continue to appeal. So I guess I'm saying I think it's not going to get huge. It's just going to keep kind of simmering for a while and probably wind down in a few years although paleo people might have something else to say about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have a few more questions trickle in, but let us just, um, um, after the webinar, I will post those on our website on packagefacts.com with some answers and some sort of afterthoughts in relation to the webinar. Again, Kara, you covered a tremendous amount of ground. Um, thank you very much. Thank you also for all of our attendees and our clients. Thank you.